And now, for the part of the evening that I know you have been anxiously awaiting, I know that certainly I have, um, the introduction of our speaker will be done by our most capable President Avant, and of course our speaker who probably needs no introduction, but at this time uh, I'm going to yield the floor to President Avant. Thank you, Carol. Um, I'm not sure who Dick's cook is, uh, but it comes in plastic bottles. Uh, so thank the trees for the maple syrup and the trees for the lemons and God for the water. Uh, and that's his complete meal. So I know he's energized, so I won't take, I'll, I'll, while he's full of octane, I'll have to get him up here while he's at maximum strength. You can see he's loading up to the left here of the podium. Um, let me give you a little bit of a background on Dick Gregory and his extra, extraordinary career. Some Americans know him as a nationally recognized author and nutritionist. Others remember how he kept them laughing as a successful stand-up comedian in the early 1960s. But perhaps Gregory's strongest influence has been and continues to be felt through his tireless efforts as a civil rights activist uh, in and around the nation. It was, I have to tell this little story about what happened to Dick and I one day. Uh, we was over to a friend's house, and I said, Dick, you know, uh, they're getting ready to pass a new civil rights bill up on the hill. He said, well, they have about as much chance of passing that bill as my running and getting hit in the head by a limb. Well, three days later, what happened, Greg? The limb hit him. <laughs> so, so there are some interesting, we have some interesting fellowships uh, on the hill. But anyway, not only, let me give you a little background that gets Dick to where, where he really is. Looking at Dick, you would think, well, not football player, uh, not basketball player, uh, Potato maybe. Who was at the play yesterday? Potato, he might be. Uh, but, but most certainly not football player. A standout athlete at Southern, Gregory was selected as SIU's first black outstanding athlete of the year in 1953. The same season he had lettered in cross country and served as the captain of the track team and became the fastest half miler in the school's history. He was inducted into the SIU Hall of Fame in 2000 in 1987, the university presented him with the Doctorate of Humane Letters. Uh, Dick and I talk often about SIU, but Gregory always reminded me that he was influenced by SIU track and fields coach Leland Doc Lingle and President Dwight Morris at Southern. Uh, he, he also always reminds me of how much appreciation he has and thanks for what the university has been able to afford him. So without further ado, uh, let's let him have some high octane juice and give it to us, brother. Let me uh, first say we thank and praise God that we've all made it here safely today. I pray to God that your return and my return will be equally as safe. Second, let me say thanks to those of you that's responsible for this weekend. My job's very easy. All I have to do is produce a body. But a lot of work went into making this happen. And so for those of you that's responsible for that, we say thank you. God bless you. <laughs> Secondly, let me say for those that, that handles the physical part, Someone picked me up at 
hotel, and somebody going to take me back. <laughs> Look around here. These tables didn't just jump up here and the food didn't cook itself. And those tables out there didn't arrange themselves. There's a whole lots of invisible people who never get thanks. Hmm? And unbeknown to a lot of us, when we leave here this evening, somebody's going to clean up behind us. So for those that's responsible for that, we say thank you. God bless you. I've been living in California for the last couple of months and, and staying with one of the richest guys in Hollywood, Ed Weinberger, who used to be one of my comedy writers when he couldn't write. <laughs> but he paid attention. In a nice atmosphere, and he's the one who created the Bill Cosby show, and if Bill had made a, a billion, he's made five. He created Rhoda, he created Taxi, he created all the major shows. And the reason I'm telling you this, he just built a $180 million house. And I'm staying there, and I was saying to a friend of mine that picked me up the other day as we went out the gate that night. There's a human being guarding that house while they house go unguarded. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> while we sleep, there's a human being that can't sleep. And we wonder how many times we slow up and say thanks. How many times when you walk through the airport and, and, and not the ticket or the pilot or the stewards, but the ones that's cleaning it up so it's spotless for you the next morning. How many times do we slow up and just say to that universal energy, thank you for them? Right. So for those of you that do all the invisible, we say thank you. Thank you. And finally, I want y'all to look around real good before you walk out of here. There's no homeless folks in here tonight. That means every one of you had something to do this weekend. But you interrupted it huh? yes. Yes. to be here. And had you not been willing to do that, the rest of this wouldn't have mattered. So to you and you and you, we say thank you. Thank you. I uh, been having fun since I've been here, seeing folks I haven't seen in years. A lot of people keep asking me, say, you know, how old are you? I'm 71. They say, you know, you look so well. How do you know when you're getting old? <laughs> you know when you're getting old, when somebody compliment them beautiful alligator shoes you wearing and you barefooted. <laughs> you know you're getting old when you go to the doctor and the doctor say you need an x-ray and just hold you up to the light. <laughs> you know you're getting old when your lady or your man yell downstairs Run upstairs and let's have some sex. And you yell back, you know I can just do one or the other. <laughs> now, if you black folks, excuse me, I want to talk to the white folks that's in here. But first, let me say before I talk to you white folks that I thank you black folks for bringing me here because I was really doing Africa uh, with Al Sharpton and the whole group that's over there now. Uh, but very seldom, those of you that 
that know me know that I very seldom get to talk to these many black folks. Most of my audience is 98% white because of my prices. <laughs> So for black folk, you know, I cut it all the way down to the bottom. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I charge white folks more than I charge black folks. <laughs> and the reason I tell you white folk that, because I know they're going to tell you. <laughs> now, white folk, for a few minutes, let me just tell you about a bad experience I had because of y'all. I was flying in from L.A. to here. Now, any experience you have bad at the airport, you can blame on white folks. <laughs> because the airport is 99.9% .9 white folks. <laughs> now, anytime you white folks got to complain about Greyhound, bring it to us. <laughs> what it is about you white folks that look at some jet travel as something else other than getting you from one point to another. Y'all want to take it as some kind of mark of sophistication. And so that means you take all kind of stuff off them folks at the airport that a brother and sister would never tolerate at Graham. <laughs> Now, because the weather was bad, and they said, well, you know, we got a problem getting you to Chicago. Say, this is the first plane leaving out, and it's full, and there's just one seat left. Now, we know you got first class, but, you know, because we know you, you travel with us a lot, we saved you one seat. You're the only person that was doing that flight that's going to put on this one, but it's just one seat left, and that's an economy in the exit row. <laughs> well, wanting to be here with you, I said, well, okay. Now, white folks, listen to me. I sit there in the exit row, and they, they brought me a damn book about what my duties was <laughs> if something happened on the plane. Can you white folks be that stupid? applying for no job. <laughs> and let me tell you white folks something. If you ever sit next to me on the exit road where they talking about, will you be willing to help? Let me know. I got on this plane by myself. <laughs> and if the plane land okay, I'm getting off by myself. And you know if it's a damn wreck, I ain't even planning on getting my briefcase. The only thing they ever said at the airport made sense to me is my oldest son, when he was four years old, me and him was going to Mexico. And them stewards, they'd be, they said, now, in case the, the, there's a problem with the oxygen coming, now let me tell y'all something. <laughs> Especially my Greyhound brothers and sisters. <laughs> if you ever on a plane and that oxygen, you better put it on quick because you got two seconds or you are dead. But they don't want to scare white folks, so they act make y'all think y'all got a whole lot of time. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm sitting there with my four-year-old son, and, and she said, in case there's an emergency, you need some oxygen, uh, you parents that's traveling with small children, put yours on first. Well, I was going to do that anyway. <laughs> I told my son at four years old who can be a little strange every now and then, I said, boy, you're not traveling with your mama. If you see anything, you reach and grab it or you're going home in a box. <laughs> so speaking of children, anybody with my income could get 10 children out of college. I got them out the house. You got to be a genius to do that.
Then moved to a house too small for all of them to come back at the same time. I think they booking now for Christmas. <laughs> now, now, white folks, I ain't finna talk to you. Now the airplane takes off. Now, after you get up there, they read you the weather report and federal regulations. Like, if you don't like what you hear, what you gonna do? Get off. <laughs> See, it's something about Greyhound. If they treated us like that at Greyhound, they would be snatched from the other side of that counter. <laughs> you call the airline, uh, uh, what time is it? You can't even get through for 45 minutes. You're on hold and they play an opera. <laughs> you call Greyhound, what time is your next, your next bus going to Memphis? What time can you get here, sir? <laughs> Then they talk about in case they have to make a water land. Then they're going to tell you how to use the life preserver. You ever heard that demonstration? They tell you, and you got to think. They say you put it on, but you don't inflate it until you get outside. Why? Because they don't know if they work. They want you to believe that they don't inflate it because you can't get out the door with 230 people behind you, you won't get out that door. <laughs> you up there now, they're telling you there's some heavy turbulence between here. Greyhound will tell you for that bus take off. There's a hell of a storm between here and Memphis. <laughs> Y'all still want to go? And then they'll lose your bag at the airport, and it's amazing what you white folks are tolerate. You're sitting there looking at that stupid thing go around for an hour, <laughs> then it dawned on you, your bag didn't show. <laughs> now you got to go stand in a line with 300 people, fill out an application, and they say, well, if you haven't heard from us in six weeks. <laughs> I got a three-day vacation. Greyhound could never get by with that. I was on Greyhound, there's a storm, and it puts on Greyhound. I guess this white boy, first time he ever been on a bus. And like I say, the airline, they won't even tell you the bags. Greyhound, you like to hang around. They'll tell you two hours before that bus get into St. Louis, all the bags got ripped off in Memphis. <laughs> So this white dude looked at me and said, excuse me, sir, what do we have to do to fill out to get them bags? No, 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 they don't have that at Greyhound. <laughs> at that airport, they have a thing called Lost and Found Greyhound. They just got a room called Lost. <laughs> they don't pretend they're going to get your bags. You just go in there, and the Greyhound pretty cool. They said everybody traveled and basically had the same thing, so just go in there and get you a couple of bags and get on out of here. Now, the plane crash. Horrible. Tragedy. You my wife, I'm your husband. I just got wiped up plane crash. You got to wait 12 years for a seven. And you got to get a lawyer 40%. Greyhound don't even play that. <laughs> Greyhound had that bus that went down that mountain in Arizona, went seven miles down, they showed up right on the spot and looked down and said, well, you can tell from the skid marks, the driver must have been high. <laughs> and if you look at the devastation, you know nobody got saved, so there's no need us even wasting a life trying to go down there and salvage that. And they pull that checkbook out right there on the spot and say, what was that nigga worth to you? <laughs> Now, now, let's back up. Don't be too cold-blooded. As a other thing, she just lost her husband. 
The airline, 12 years later, she'll get a salary. They'll give it to you right there that night, baby. Makes for a hell of a funeral. It puts a smile on your face. And so somewhere, I wish you white folks would do something about the airline. I've been married 44 years. No, no, oh, love ain't got nothing to do with it. I first got married, my wife told me the first night, nigga, if you ever leave me, I'll hurt you. <laughs> and hurt will keep you home for a long time. And then when you start making big money, there's another word that'll keep you home that Michael Jordan just found out about called half. <laughs> the biggest problem I had when I first got married is my old lady couldn't deal with, with debt. Well, we're gonna pay Sears and Roebuck. Baby, you act like we got some money. We ain't got no money. And when I get me some money, Sears and Roebuck is not my first priority. They knew I wasn't going to pay for that stuff when I got it. <laughs> On the back of the application, they said, who's going to pay for this? I said, your mama. <laughs> I walked in the house two weeks later. I thought Lillian was going crazy, screaming. They did it, they did it. Sears and Roebuck, here it is, final notice. I looked at it, final notice. <laughs> Thank God we won't be hearing from them no more. <laughs> How y'all go to college with all these degrees and got all these good jobs and don't understand stress? <laughs> stress, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, but it will wipe you out. <laughs> Call yourself church, god fearing folks and don't know Fear and God do not occupy the same space. My brother called me the other day from Kansas City. They about to repossess my car. What must I do? Don't park in front of the house. <laughs> See, one of the things you got to understand that there's a universal God for us they said the answer to all major problems is simplicity, but nobody can make no money till they make it complex. Huh? I'm in Budapest four weeks ago. Well, I folks pay me $40,000 to get inside my head. So I go over there and, and they say, Mr. Gregory, uh, what's the foremost thought you're dealing with. Like, I said, well, I'm trying to figure out how I can be 71 years old and ain't never seen a baby pigeon. <laughs> I say, matter of fact, I don't know nobody that's ever seen a baby pigeon. <laughs> and I ain't never seen a pigeon ever sitting on a tree branch. They're always on some electrical wire. And there's billions of pigeons God had put on this planet. And you know they die, where they go? You don't see them. <laughs> they ain't got no pigeon graveyard. <laughs> and you know, white folk wasn't ready for it. They tried to regroup and say, well, you have any other problem? I said, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what happened to albinos after high school. <laughs> Every high school got one. I don't see none in here tonight. <laughs> I'm on airplanes every day, never seen an albino. You ain't never turned on TV and hear that woman say, that albino raped me, that'd be easy to catch. <laughs> Fear and God. There's a universal law that God don't give a damn about your degree. You can go to school and learn how to make a living, but God say, if you don't learn how to live, I'll take you out of here at 35. That's the best Y'all can go through these institutions and be so evil and nasty and honored. And let me tell you, 
You can get dressed for society, but if you don't get dressed for the universe, it don't count. <laughs> society have a certain way you get dressed. You put your underwear on first. You put your overcoat on last. Universe say, I don't care what you put on, the last thing you better put on is a smile on your face. <laughs> and if you walk around, especially you black folk with them evil look, never smiling to the universal God, you're not dressed, and that's a violation. <laughs> you can play all the games you want to play. I can't believe black folk can be upset over the word nigger, something you could never be. The little redneck heathens that created that name qualifies to be that. But all at once, you upset over that. If the word nigger bother you, then you got some niggerism in you. If I say tonight, all you hoes stand up, if that bother you, ho, I didn't call your name. <laughs> how, how can you black folks assume you get upset over the word nigger, but you don't get upset over the word billionaire? How can you assume you never be a billionaire but got doubt to be a nigger? And then look at, look, 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 I mean, all at once now, the word nigger was cool until it got out the box. Long as black folk and white folk said it with each other. But they never thought they would see today, and I'm responsible for that because a major book, I should have made millions. I didn't make millions this because I named it nigger. I said, I'm going to take this nigger snake and defame it. And they were scared to put it on the shelf. Black folk were going to say, I want one of them Dick Gregory Westmacolls. <laughs> And we never thought we'd sit there with white children would wake up and greet one another. You my nigga, baby. <laughs> Hollywood used the word nigga. It's in the music. And now that it's out here, don't nobody want to hear it. The OJ trial, they changed it, and I couldn't believe you black folk could be that stupid to the N-word. No, no, hear me, baby. Because if we don't understand this thing of the victim blaming they self, huh? The N word is the 14th letter of the alphabet. And if I was a little German or a Russian child and hear black folks is upset over the N word and I checked it out and find out the N word is the 14th letter of the alphabet, I think y'all stupid. So all of us, you going to sit by and let a white racist system change history. And what day will my Jewish brothers and sisters become insulting and insane enough to be ashamed of what Hitler and them Nazis did and let them change the word concentration camp to the C word and swastika to the S word? <laughs> what day will women assert they self to men can't rape you no more. And men get so embarrassed over our past history, we get you to change the word rape to the R word. It don't tell what have happened to you. So y'all can play all your little games. And how you black folk can get embarrassed because another nigga committed a crime. But come, that makes you a criminal. This nigga here messed up the New York Times. I'm so happy that this nigga did it. Jason, he got all of them fired because he lied. <laughs> I called Kobe's lawyer. I said, y'all better try to hire Jason to get him out of this mess because the brother can lie. <laughs> when you sit and you listen to all this old craziness, on the show the other day, why about talking about, well, you know, the black woman have X amount of babies out of wedlock. What y'all gonna do about that? Give me that white woman's abortion credit card and I'll show you how to knock a nigga right down. <laughs> and you black folks get all insulted over what a white racist system has put you through, and then they throw it back up in your face. There's something wrong with that. And as long as you internalize that and hold all that in you, you will self-destruct. 
somewhere you got to understand that this country is the most racist, sexist, insane nation that ever existed in the history of the planet. And the only reason it's getting better was a handful of black and white folk that put our life on the line and said, we're not going to tolerate it no more. When a white woman didn't get the right to vote to 1920, and she came over on the boat with that boy. And the only reason she got the right to vote was not out of the goodness of that white boy's heart. She was willing to go to jail and die and be part of the struggle. That's what it's about. Oh, I sit here and I listen to the, the glorification of SIU. And I say, let me tell you why you can brag about that. Because of a white man named Dr. Morris. Hear me. No, 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 no. No, no. Hear me. I was here. There wasn't another institution on this planet if that was as racist as this one, that there was more racist, but they wouldn't let black folks in. And a handful of us that had some decent white folks. I'm in a history class, and when they get to the part about Negro, he put the word nigger on the board. John, all right. And I went up to him, he thought I was upset. I said, no, 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 I'm not upset. Just spell it with a capital N. <laughs> In the history of this school, no black person had ever become outstanding at the leader of the year. And if you looked at the records, we, called, we had all of them except skin. <laughs> and so we changed that. We went by to see Doc. He said, we're fixing the rumble. When's the next time you're going to be out of town? <laughs> the varsity theater. You couldn't sit anywhere you wanted to sit. Let me tell you, black folks, something about the black folks in this town. And SIU, one day, you're going to have to honor them. Because when a black woman couldn't stay in a dormitory, and black men didn't feel comfortable if you wasn't an athlete. It was those black folks in town that nurtured us. <laughs> and then a white racist system talking about how many black women get pregnant. Send that white woman out there. Get her out the dormitory and let her live in town and see how quick she get knocked up. But we had some white folks and some black folks that decided we didn't just want an education. I'll never forget, hear me please. I came here from St. Louis, Missouri. First person in my family that ever went to college. I got here, it was the first time I've been around white folks in my life that I didn't have to call Mr. or Mrs. And it was the first time I've been around white folks that had to call me by my name. Huh? You know what that's like to be born in 1932 and come here in 1952 and never could I address a white person without calling him Mr. and Mrs. And I'm sitting here that first day and I see this president walk up to talk to us. And he said something that changed my life. He said, you can stay here, you can get all your degrees, but if you don't understand the power of God, you'll fail you. That's what I heard my first day here from a white man. And I looked at my man and I said, wow. And my psyche changed. Huh? I've never been around, I haven't been around no ugly white folks until I got here. <laughs> Where would I see them? In the movie, they didn't let ugly white folks in the movie. <laughs> I didn't 
no, I thought all white folks were smart. When I saw this old dumb white boy trying to cheat off my paper, I thought he was a decoy. <laughs> but I got here and understood that white folks wasn't that smart. If you belong to the right fraternity, you could go steal the test before test time. So we organized the brothers and sisters and said the white fraternities is getting the test. I said, what are we going to do? I said, be cool. The black janitor got all the keys to all of them. So we went in town and we'd take them black. We'd give them tickets to homecoming. We'd give them tickets to the football game. We treated them like they wasn't janitors, like they was the nigga that had the key to that office. <laughs> and here's what all the white folks was complaining about. How come all you colored folks, when you go to cafeteria, y'all won't sit together? Because the little nigga over there, Eric, he the one with the hot sauce. <laughs> What do you black folks understand? You cannot be a racist. I can dislike you because you're Irish Catholic. I can dislike you because you're Jewish. I can dislike you because you're Polish. That's prejudice. The word racism means the ability to control somebody else's faith and destiny. And because I don't like you because you're white, I do not have the power to see to it that you can't get a mortgage. I do not have the power to see to it that your children can't you know, get in a good school. And the reason you're so comfortable here today because it was the Leo Wilsons and the Harvey Welches huh? and all the black folks. Didn't surprise me when I looked up and saw the, the brother, the Secretary of State, first time in the history of America, his roots was here. Huh? I sit here today and hear a sister over here Washington running for center, a woman back then. Couldn't even think about that. And so I say to you, especially you youngsters, we've come a long way. And when you sit here and look at them, roll off the numbers here, what this school is like. You got to go back to a, a beautiful white brother, his whole family. Huh? When you walked across campus, it was like talking to a friend that you grew up with. Huh? And we worked to change it when you couldn't get on a, black women couldn't get in a dormitory. We, went, we met and we negotiated and said, well, can you wait till we build a new one and we'll, okay. Black folks couldn't have a house on fraternity, fraternity row. All that was negotiated with no bitterness. Why? Because we had some white folks. Huh? That all you had to do was ask. Sometimes they would resist, but they didn't bother us because we wasn't going away. Huh? And then to sit back and see how far. And the same thing could happen in America that have happened here if you black folks had the backbone to seek out the decent white folks like we did and work for change, not through meanness and bitterness. Black folks can walk around them evil looks on your face. That, that ain't gonna pay Neiman Marcus. <laughs> and understand what we're dealing with. America is one-sixth of the world's population. And as we sit here tonight, 89% of the world's hard drugs is consumed by Americans. What God y'all believe in? That's the price you have to pay for a white racist sexist system. You have to stay drunk, out of your mind, 24 hours a day. <laughs> we ain't talking about alcohol yet. And caffeine and nicotine. Mountain Dew got more caffeine in one bottle than 10 cups of coffee. And that's what you give to your children. Every four seconds you sitting here this evening, a woman in America been beat up by her boyfriend or husband. Not no blood to Crips. 
And you sisters, my God, what have you been through? A white racist sexist system plus old crazy me. <laughs> and we survived. The strongest two forces in the history of America has always been the black woman in the black church. Right. Hmm? <laughs> they want to sit around and insult about uh, 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 the problem with the, the black community. Ain't no black man at home. Hey, we ain't home when we home. <laughs> Jack the Ripper had a mother and a father. Hitler had a mother and a father. The mafia, you, you can't get no more family orientated. They're never tagging thugs. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth, now she's my type of white folks. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth made $365 million every 24 hours, just interest on her money. <laughs> now, them these white folks, <laughs> Kirby. And I like them because they don't lie. They tell you, we're going to war to protect our interests. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth lives in Buckingham Palace. I've been there twice. Plus, she got castles all around. Ever since she's had children, she's been with that one man, Philip. The man was home, one of the richest white women in the world, and you can't find no more messed up, dysfunctional children than hers. <laughs> Prince Charles in love with an ugly old white woman. <laughs> that her old husband didn't even want. And you gonna tell me my problem? And y'all suck enough to fall for that? Because you're crazy. <laughs> and then black folks want to be validated by a white racists. Always want to pay your bills on time. <laughs> Always want to be early because white folks expect to be. I don't trust a nigga that, that's on time. <laughs> I was shocked when I got here late and saw so many of y'all already here. In the black church, this is why America has grown the progress it has made in 40 years. Hmm? Look at the civil rights movement because you can't get an honest shake here in America. 99% of the folks in the forefront of that movement had reverend in front of their name, not Dr. So-and-so. And the world has never been the same. And they honor everybody on this planet except us. Oh, they want to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Tiananmen Square where some Chinese laid down in front of a tank with no gun. They learned that from us. Nobody never laid down in front of a tank with no gun until they saw black women and children and decent white folks in Birmingham and Mississippi looked at the mightiest nation world and said, bring on your best shot, punk. We ain't blue. <laughs> when that thug lost the election in Bosnia, he said to the winner, we ain't going nowhere come Saturday. I'm going to be swore in because we had the army. And the world press flew in from all over the world to record that bloodbath. And at 12 noon, that Saturday, 270,000 white folks showed up at the town square with no guns, singing, we shall overcome. Huh? And the army threw down their guns and joined them. And not one person died that day. That's the leadership we've given the world. That's the leadership we gave this institution. Why? Because you had some white folks that would let us. Huh? Or sometimes they say you're moving too fast. We made like we were slowing up. 
hear me. When the Berlin Wall fell down, them white folks wasn't singing God bless America, they were singing we shall overcome. That's what this movement is about. That's why this institution is the way it is now. Because that seed was planted back there. And we didn't take nothing, we didn't compromise, we didn't threaten, we didn't go nowhere, we ain't going nowhere. Can you know what it felt like to me to go out one day and win the mile, the half mile, the two miles, and anchor the mile relay team to victory, and we won the conference meet by one point? And then walk in town that night and see my white friends that got the ring and the championship jacket in a white restaurant that I can't go into. But they wouldn't have that ring and that jacket on had it not been for my effort and the other blacks, so I took a brick and threw it through the window. <laughs> Y'all know when the white folks liked it, they liked it. The police showed up and said, well, he, he just had a hard day today. He just going through some illusions. <laughs> we refuse to be gladiators for a white racist system. And that's why this is one of the finest diverse universities on this planet. It didn't used to be that way. I was suspicious when I got here and bumped into people from strange little towns. Murfreesboro. <laughs> I didn't know where all the white students was going to cook, and I found out that was the whole house. And didn't do us no good to go. All the hoes was black, but they didn't deal with black folks. And now to be able to come back here. Huh? My life has touched people all over the way. I don't need to be validated by the New York Times. Huh? Because of this institution. Huh? Not because of the way it was, but what together we was able to make it be. So when I see this brother sitting here in the position he is, you work for that. Huh? Huh? A white woman with a PhD make 87 cents on the dollar compared to a white boy with the same degree. Huh? That's what this institution got to be about as you move into that, that next phase to see to it that, that women Equal pay, you got to go out and reach out and find you some Indians on the reservation and bring them here and nurture them through a degree. Right. Huh? And when you do that, God will protect you. And when I talk about God, I ain't talking about no isms and osms. We owe big debt to the black folks in town. We owe big debt to Right, Morris and his family. Because the atmosphere in this area here, that boy could have been hurt. <laughs> because when we was here, this was not a beautiful rose like it is today. It was a thorn in some dirty, nasty bushes. And working together. Huh? And I ain't going to sit in and lie to you and tell you all of them was. Working together, that changed. So now where do you go from here? Huh? You go in town and say thank you to them folks by finding if you can send some of their children to school here, just to say thanks for covering us when we didn't cover ourselves. <laughs> where do you go from here at 300 and some odd million dollar grant y'all fixing to get to rejuvenate? You make sure you got some black contractors and some women contractors and some minorities in policy making positions where they can get some of that money. No, no. And you black folks don't use this school just to come back every so many years to get your thing off. You leave here and you go work. You protect the decent folks here. The women, you make sure the women get treated right here. You make sure these black folks is here, is here comfortable 
if they would be, if they were white. That's your job. Not just to come back here every so many years and say, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> this school, I owe a debt to. Huh? I was the first black person in the history of America they let give the commencement address at Harvard University. And then one number some tricking white folks. It was 1975, and in 1925, the class of 1925 produced more millionaires and billionaires than any other Harvard class. And they wanted to impress that money so they would contribute more. And at that time, a white child didn't give a damn about hanging around for graduation. So they asked, who would you like to have for the commencement speaker? And they said, Dick Gray. And the people that ran in school resented the fact that they had to bring me, but it was about keeping them there so they could get the money. And I threw a zinger on them. I said, I'll come on one condition. I don't want none of your dirty blood honorary, and I don't want no honorary doctor's degree from this nasty, stinking institution. <laughs> Harvard is right next to MIT. I live 48 miles down the road, and they tried to recruit every one of my children. A dog that I wouldn't like, I wouldn't let go to neither one of them. <laughs> let me tell y'all something, because you're in an illusion. Harvard and MIT have more suicides in one year than the Big Ten schools have in 20. So who decided that they do a citadel of intellectuality? They're nothing but cesspools of filth. This is what you can do with this institution. Not just come and get a degree, but can you be comfortable? Can you be happy? Can you be friendly to one another? Can you walk past campus and just glad to see one another? Y'all don't have no problem walking now. The reason I stayed here so long when I was dumb, I was just smart. I'd walk and take three steps and stop and look around. <laughs> they said, what you doing? I said, I know they're doing something. Man. <laughs> and so I say to those of you, you old timers that's here, you white professors when there were no black ones, those of you all that reached out to us, huh? that's what made me. Huh? The brothers and the sisters, huh? that reached out to us and was willing to say, whatever you want, we had a leadership, whatever you want, we'll back you. And so somewhere, when I go to Buckingham Palace or go around the world and meet with folks, I can call Buckingham Palace tonight. I'm sure the queen wouldn't call me back, but somebody gonna call me. I can call the White House tonight out of all the things I've said about Bush. Somebody from the White House gonna call me where did that come from? It started here. I was coming in here on welfare, huh? Didn't know nothing about nothing. Something happened to me here because I was with some brothers and some sisters that we didn't have to be bitter. Huh? We could love and relate with one another. Huh? We could sit around and talk and plan and say, this is what we're going to do. The academia became second place to us. Look at all the colleges that cost a thousand times more to go to than here, but they can't stand up and boast of your record that you can stand up and boast to the whole world. Huh? <laughs> Got a big job. And to this brother here, bug me. I'm in the hospital. They announced on the radio, I had four operations. They didn't know if I was going to live or die. And prayers work, but I was telling the brothers and sisters, you know, y'all, you, you, you pray in school, but I owe white folks too much money to die. <laughs> Just my Neiman Marcus account to keep me alive. Now, I believe in God, but I also believe in white folks. I believe if I fell dead today, Neiman Marcus said, nigga ain't dying on me, come back! <laughs> Mm 
Now, how do you black folks say thanks for what we did and some white folks did? You don't walk around believing that all white folks got some kind of negative attitude just because your head's messed up. You belong to the NAACP, to the Urban League. You send some money to this institution. Huh? And you also send it to black institutions too, who was covering you before Harvard covered you. Never underestimate black institutions, and that's why they should be thankful that they got black students here, because you bring that intelligence. Let me tell y'all something that might shock you, but you can't lie about this one. If you had to write down 100 world-renowned African-Americans, 98 of them would be a product of black colleges. <laughs> not Harvard, not Yale, not MIT. With a weak budget, but a humanity. Huh? A friendliness. Huh? That you're something more than just a number. And so I, I say to you, thank you. Only God knows the things that I've been able to do. Walk with King, was with him a week before he was killed. Walk with Malcolm, I walked with the fine minds all over the world. And where did that start? Right here. Where did I learn how to deal with white folks and, and deal with, right here. The most powerful human being I'd ever met in my life was the president of this institution. And when he welcomed you in your house and you had to go through no buck dances, that meant I didn't have to buck dance for no white person, no place on this world. Because I met a powerful white man that didn't demand that. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Some way. So you black folk got a legacy to take with you. Hmm? And when you hear them roll off these numbers, these numbers didn't get that way just because of SIU. Got that way because of us, black folks, and those decent white folks, and that beautiful president. Huh? And if we did it way back then, y'all should have a cakewalk now. Huh? And so I say to you tonight, what a thrill. I say, oh, this brother bugged me so much about being here with that little shark money. I don't know no place I'd rather be. And I tell you nights I sit up. I'm the one that wrote the book that caused the Kennedy King assassination. I'm the one when the CIA and the FBI come to me and say, nigga, we'll kill you. I say, kill me. I say, you're crazy, nigga. You got some children you love. And I look them in the face and say, if you ever kidnap one of my children, you better do one or two things. Kill them or get you a book to teach you how to raise niggas because I ain't buying them back. This movement's bigger than me. Huh? Huh? This movement's bigger than me, it's bigger than my wife, it's bigger than my family. My oldest daughter said to me one day, when she read that, she said, Dad, you mean if somebody, somebody kidnapped me and wanted two million dollars, you wouldn't give it to them? No, I'd ask them, what do they see in you? I don't see. <laughs> and say, I got nine more of y'all here at them prices. And so I say to you today, we've come a long ways. It ain't, it ain't about the physical thing now, it's about the mental thing. What can you do, SIU, to lead the world? I'll tell you what you can do. You can put a little system together to find out what effect a white racist system has on black minds and white minds. Nobody's ever tried this yet to see what it takes to unwind it. And people would beat a path here from all over the world. Huh? What effect do it have on little girls to grow up in a sexist society? Huh? And we made so many changes. Who would have ever believed we could muddy the water so much that a senator named Strong Thurman died a few weeks ago 
been in the Senate 47 years, and we muddied the water so much with him, only seven senators showed up at his funeral. <laughs> huh? If there had been a dog at the Senate that guarded the Senate door for 47 years, more of them would have showed up for the death of that dog. <laughs> I'm telling you, this thing is changing fast. But you got to be vigilant. You got to keep your eyes open. There's a New York Times article. Didn't run no other paper. Hmm? Sunday, May the 19th, 2002, page 22. Hell of a case. Coca-Cola. I didn't know till I read this that on soda pop, there's a date on it, and after that date, that stuff, those chemicals break down into a poison, and they got to throw them away. And a handful of white folks and some black folks went into federal court and said, wait a minute, let me tell you what Coke having us doing. We go to the white stores and pick it up and take it to a warehouse outside of Dallas and redate it and send it into the black community. That don't bother me because I don't believe drinking one of them Cokes will kill you. What bothers me, I'm not stupid enough to believe that they the most trifling in the Fortune 500. What bothers me are the pharmaceutical companies doing the same thing. <laughs> Am I getting some medicine that all the juice is gone? Hmm? How long? God, have we come a long ways and we got a long way to go. Hmm? Now we look at this whole AIDS thing and look at the black folks in jail and, and y'all got nerve enough to be upset over that. Huh? Brother Danny David, remember not too long ago, a federal judge in Florida had to rule that Pizza Hut had to deliver pizzas to the black neighborhood. Now anytime I got to go to federal court just to get a pizza. <laughs> and that ain't real food. So I say to you tonight, Henry Kissinger was indicted for murder. And y'all think you, especially you white folks, think you live in a free democratic society. Not one newspaper ran that story when it was running wild all over the world. Some white folk called me and alerted me, said, you want to see something funny? Get in Paris tomorrow morning. And he was at the Rich Carlton and they served him the papers from the World Court. He ducked out that night, which means I can get a welfare mother or a hillbilly white woman tonight and go to the Ritz in Paris, but Henry Kissinger you can't go because he's a fugitive. And in this country that y'all think is so free and so brave, only one paper, eight months later, ran the story, the Village Voice, headlines, how can you arrest Henry Kissinger for war crimes? But y'all want to run around and believe that you the epitome of democracy. Can we, can we, can we get Bin Laden? Uh, uh, can we get Saddam Hussein? If it took y'all a year to arrest Beretta and he lived across the street from the police station. <laughs> Times, June the 14th, 2003, last month. Big story. Hussein's image is banned in public, except the money. And they're the only story that ran, they printed up new money three weeks ago with Saddam Hussein's picture on it. Huh? Huh? And you got your children over there dying and the folks that's doing the manipulation and making the big buck whose children ain't gone, you just in for that old sucker treat. I wonder why so many niggas in jail, I tell you why. Make a, a heart device that killed 12 people must pay $92 million. They don't have to go to jail. Huh? They knew it was defective when they made it. Why am I in jail? Huh. Here. June 19, 1999, 
Headline Virginia Union paper, Robert cited for sloppy bookkeeping. That's Pat Roberts, preacher boy. Then stole ten point five million dollars. And after two day investigation, they say, oh, sloppy bookkeeping. Uh, wait a minute. Same day, June the 19th, 1999, Washington Times, same day, convicted Baptist minister must pay back five. Point two million dollars and go to jail. The nigga stole his, the white boy sloppy bookkeeping. <laughs> and so I say to you tonight, we've come a long ways. Listen to this. In the Philadelphia Inquirer, major white newspaper, March the 9th, 1997. In daily life, black folks found to be more religious than white folks. I live in a country that a white newspaper can print that and never be accused of being a racist, huh? But if Jet Magazine said it, or Tavis Smiley said it, even some of you black folks out there would say, how can you say that? Well, white folks can say it and nobody challenge you. Huh? Now we worried about AIDS. All them trifling niggas in Africa. When they get so trifling? My oldest daughter was getting her doctor's degree at the London School of Economics, and God bless me, I just happened to be over there visiting her. And that's strange, because I got 10 children there, and that's one I really don't like. <laughs> I ain't got, got some children too, y'all don't like. You just don't admit it. <laughs> Talk about, you know, uh, uh, ain't got me name a nigga Junebug. But you know, Billy, he okay, he just a little strange. That, you know, that nigga crazy. <laughs> but God bless me while I'm over there. This headline on the front page of the London Times. Monday, May the 11th, 1987. Smallpox vaccine triggers AIDS in Africa. Huh? But you black folks, is so out of it. Anything they tell you. You know, not the white citizen council, the Ku Klux Klan, but the United States Bureau of Health took 600 black men in Tuskegee, Alabama, and said, we're going to give you a vitamin so you won't get a cold this winter. And then 50 years later, they injected syphilis into them. And y'all don't want to question, where did age come from? <laughs> and this article here runs down how the World Health Organization, they used the word mastermind, a 13-year program. And then hear this. Only ran in a black magazine two years ago. I want y'all to hear this. Action AIDS health warning. Following up on a study presented at the International AIDS Conference in Durban, South Africa, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention have issued, have issued an ur urgent AIDS health advisory. And here's what it was. Many people have been counseled that minoxin 9, better known as N9, that's that little jelly that's in condoms. Minoxin 9 strengthens an AIDS in your ability to have sex without getting AIDS or HIV. However, in a recent study conducted on 1,000 HIV AIDS negative prostitutes in Africa found that using minoxin 9 actually increased, not decreased, your chances of getting AIDS. Huh? They're putting it in the condoms. And y'all so relaxed and so this and that. We do stuff in this country that would make Hitler blush. <laughs> and now there's decent folks that's coming out that's challenging us. I never thought I'd see the day I'd have to get on the radio this morning and defend Bush and Blair. <laughs> I'm one of the few people that got enough sense to know that that scientist that got murdered over there, they would have never killed him on the day when the president and the prime minister was me. Whoever did that is after them. Huh? 
I've been up all night long talking to researchers, bringing them in, sifting through the whole basketball, COVID-19 mess. That ain't what you think it is. And he's messed up. He's going to lose all, all his little sneaker money. <laughs> I tried to get hold of Nike today and say, if y'all want to make up for that money you lose, y'all ought to make some sneakers for the black neighborhood where a nigga can outrun a white lady. <laughs> Here's a woman that's 19 years old, not a child, and nobody know her name. Huh? But last week, a 12-year-old girl that ran off with a Marine, we saw her picture and her name. Let me tell you something, I'm going to get out of here. Kobe Bryant went down and had his knee operated on that day. Now, ladies, if you know anything about a man having sex, you need your knees. <laughs> so if I just had a knee operation, then there's a certain position she had to be in and I can't not rape you and make you sit in my lap. And everybody, when it first happened, said, well, she said this and he said that. But then all at once, something changed. They said they had a witness that heard some loud noise going on next door to his room. And he called the front desk. And a manager came down, knocked on the door, the door opened, and he saw the woman in the room. So now it's no more he say, she say. Huh? Four o'clock this morning, my folks gave me a rundown on who those witnesses are. We got the whole witness sheet that the prosecutor had. You get anything you want with money. <laughs> and all the witness he lists that was in that hotel that night in rooms was cops and felons. Huh? Huh? In one of the most expensive hotels in the world, how can they afford to be in there? Huh? Now, I don't give a damn about that punk. I'm talking about when y'all don't understand, Bill Cosby was the darling of a white racist system until that nigga said he wanted to buy NBC. Son died, and then a daughter popped up that nobody know about. <laughs> Also found out that DEA yesterday said they found drugs in his room. Any of y'all hear that story? Let me tell you what that means. How can the DEA find drugs on June the 30th, but they don't even announce it until after the day he get indicted and they didn't arrest him? Huh? And the reason I'm telling you this now, because they're going to ease it out little by little. found out that Kobe Bryant been busted 12 times in police stings with prostitutes. No, 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 shh, shh, shh. listen. Let me tell you how it works. I'm a cop in Chicago. Run the mall squad. Control the pimps and the hustlers and also hook to the mafia. These athletes have been told, just don't have sex with these ordinary women because they'll sue you, get you some freaky hoes that won't get pregnant while won't sue you. But they don't know that that's a whole cop mafia thing. So he's in the room and all at once the door is kicked in and they come in with cameras and he bought pants and no, 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 hey man, you my man, man. Don't worry about it. This coming Friday when y'all playing in Kansas City, don't score but six points. Have you ever got enough sense to ask how that boy can score 40 points one night, 50 the next, then Friday score seven? Huh? 
That's what this game is about. Why y'all think it's just some kind of sports. And you black folks is gonna get a wake up call because they trying to tell y'all these little thugs y'all producing that the day is over. Basketball ain't entertainment, boy. It's a major white trillion dollar business. Huh? So, so I say to you tonight, take care of your body. Hmm? You go home, look at your hotel at home, look at your toothpaste. And read the small print in the back where it say, do not swallow. Huh? They don't put that on cocaine. <laughs> and then the last sentence say, in case you do swallow, contact the poison control center, because the ordinary medical doctor is not qualified to save you. Huh? So I, I say to you tonight, you black folks, It is a violation of God. Hear me good now. It is a violation of God for you to reduce yourself below the dignity that God gave you to a white racist system just so you can pay your rent or feed your family or send your children to college. <laughs> and that God for us say, before I tolerate that, I will destroy you from the inside. And if you don't believe it, look at the stats, black folks. You less than 12% of America's population. 87% hmm? of everybody right this moment on kidney dialysis machines is black folks. Hmm? What God you praying to? Hmm? They don't have one kidney dialysis machine in all of Africa. Why? They're too poor, they don't need it. Black men, less than 4% of America's population. 83% of prostate cancer death in America is black men. And then what do they tell me is causing it? Uh, you don't get examined. Huh? And y'all suck enough to believe that? Where they get examined in Africa? Huh? Are you telling me a redneck hillbilly that can't read or write living in the trail of uh, he go get examined? Huh? Why y'all fall for? It didn't even trick me. I said, I'm going to get examined. Now, ladies, I don't know if you know how they do prostate cancer. They put a glove on, tell you to bend over, and... <laughs> and I didn't mind it. I was just trying to be brave for the brother, and I'm looking around, and I'm going to do it. And look around, and this cat got both his hands on my shoulder. And so I leave you tonight and I say to you, when you go home, send a prayer and a meditation for the folks, many of them are dead, that make this school the institution it is. Pray for their families and their friends and their loved ones. When I think about Coach Al Lingo, I never had a decent father in my life. He's a white man. He's the one who came to the movie and told me my mother was dead, huh? And then hugged me and said, I can drive you home to St. Louis tonight. I said, no, it's too late. I'll wait and go in the morning, huh? That's what this institution means to me. And so the other day when I was sick, I, I, I you, got, you ain't got no choice of taking care of your body. I had four operations just from a nosebleed. And they just got the bill. My wife just faxed me the bill. <laughs> One million, one hundred and sixty-nine thousand dollars. Here's one bill for one day service, eighty-two thousand dollars. This is America. Huh? I just went in there and act like I had some insurance. They damn sure can't even undo what they did. <laughs> I'll leave you tonight with this. And I want you black folks to hear this real good because I'm one of the strong 
black minds on this planet will die for you. If somebody walked up here and whispered in my and said, Brother Greg, we're fixing to blow this room up. We tear us, but we give you time to get out. I will stay here and die with you. Now, I'll be honest, if I was outside, I wouldn't. <laughs> And so, black folks, slow up. White folk can't help you in many respects because they don't know how crazy you are. Because you don't know you're crazy. You've never heard a black man complain about a cop took a nightstick and hit his car, but you can kill my mama, my daddy, and nothing will happen, but they know they better not mess with your car. Huh? Black folks worry about the word nigger, but there's some black folks sitting in here tonight that if your son or daughter, or grandson or daughter came home with a nigger as black as me, y'all be upset, but don't nobody want to deal with that. Hmm? Hmm? I'm 71 years old. I remember when a black child was born, we asked about the texture of the hair, and we did ask about the health of the child. As I, you hear what I'm saying, there need to be an institution set up to flush this out and unwind this mind. And in freeing me, you free yourself. Somewhere. You don't think you need some help. This woman and her five children died brother threw a firebomb in the house because she walked out on the corner and said, I don't have enough money to, to leave in Baltimore. If I could, I would, but I got to raise my family here and I just asked y'all to take your drugs off my corner. He came back that night and threw a firebomb in the house. Firefighters came and put it out. They arrested him. And Two days later, he was back on the street. Three o'clock, he came back and threw a firebomb and burnt her and her five children up. Her husband was carried to the hospital with third degree burns. He died the day of their funeral. And I know damn good and well, had he threw a firebomb in a white woman's parents' house, he would not been back on the street. So black folks understand. We live in a country where white folks tend, and we too, to put more value on white life than we put on black life. And so I interrupted my trip in Europe and got on a plane and, and flew back to Baltimore just to say thanks to the sister. And you know what it's like walking into the church and see six hearses? And you think you've seen it all till you walk inside and see six coffins. Now I want y'all to hear this. In SIU, I'm telling you this because this is what we need. The place was packed. The governor, everybody was there. The white mayor walked to the podium and he started reading the speech that Martin Luther King gave for the four little girls that was killed when the 16th Street Baptist Church. And I sit there and I listen to this white man saying King's words, word for word. I was there, I left the church the day before the bombing to go to New York. I was there for the funeral. And as this white brother sit there, the mayor of Baltimore giving King's speech, I just drifted and I hear King talking. And I remember when King said, whoever did this, we must not hate them. We must love them and ask for forgiveness. And I remember that day 40 years ago, hear me black folks one of the most powerful niggas on the planet. I am. And I sit there that day, and without hesitating, ask God to forgive whoever those white folks was. Now, 40 years later, I'm sitting in Baltimore, and I'm listening to this white man, and I hear King, and I tried to ask God to forgive a nigga that did it, and I 
couldn't. I couldn't. I found no problem praying for some redneck nigga hating crackers for God to forgive them. But this country that messed up my head so bad, I couldn't ask God to forgive a black man that looked like me. Huh? This was two months ago. SIU, we need help. We need a department to go in there and undo this. Huh? And so I said, okay, brother, you can kiss your goodbye this evening. You ain't going nowhere. And at that point, I didn't care about the funeral. I didn't do nothing else. I'm dealing with something inside of me I didn't know was there. Me willing to die for the brother and the sister. Love the brothers and sister, but couldn't ask God to forgive them. So I said, you will not leave here until you reach inside of you and whatever that filth is in you, flush it out. Because you're going to ask God to forgive this brother if it takes the rest of your life. And it took me about an hour. And you know how I did it? Real quick. Forgive me, God. <laughs> and I slowed up and said, take your time. I just want to share that story with you, those of you all that walk around and because you think you're black and, and you, you belong to the right organizations and you're willing to do stuff, but we haven't slowed up to get this built out. And so I thank you, brother. I thank you for being able to head this organization and, and take it to where you can go. And finally, my baby son is the financial analyst for the city of New York. Now, he cannot tell them white folks how to spend $34 billion, but they can't touch it until that boy analyzes. <laughs> How'd he get that job? I'm his daddy. How did I have the type of wisdom to raise them the way I did this institution? And let me tell y'all something. This institution, you didn't have to go four years and graduate. You could just been here one semester and it changed your life. Huh? And those of you all that got some children out there that don't qualify to go to college because of some old silly test, let them go one time and they don't have to walk through life with some grudge like, if I just would have been to college, my life would have changed. And they start drinking because they think they missed something. Huh? They miss nothing. You think about how much drinking y'all do on a college campus? <laughs> how much sex go down? And especially you black folks, if that's all you want to do, you could have more fun. So you know how much fun it is having sex and drinking when you don't have to study? <laughs> and so I called my son and I asked him, I said, son, do me a favor. I said, take your mathematical mind and tell me how much this planet weighs in tons. Hmm? And he called me right back and said, dad, here it is. Six sextillion, 660 quintillion tons. I said, son, I don't know what a sextillion is. <laughs> he said, that's a six with 24 zeros. I said, what's a quintillion? He said, that's a one with 18 zeros. I said, thank you very much. And I was going to talk to one of my atheist partners. We get along real good, we'll have no problem. And I said to him, I said, let me just show you something, because I'm not trying to convince you to do nothing. I said, I just worked this out with my son, that this planet weighs six sextillion, 660 quintillion tons. And then I took a Kleenex out, and I held it up, and I dropped it. <laughs> and I said, hold this clinics, and he did, and he dropped it, and it fell, and I said, this planet weighs 600, six sextillion, 660 quintillion tons, and ain't nothing holding it. Huh? Hear me, but if you drop a clinics, it falls, and that same God force that takes care of this planet 
spinning around the sun at a thousand miles an hour with nothing holding it. That's the same God force that put you together. And so you don't have to leave here afraid of nothing. Leave here happy. Laugh. Enjoy yourself. Don't be stupid enough to believe that some professional comedian got to come by and, and, and make you enjoy yourself. The biggest yacht you ever had come from friends and relatives. Stop hanging out with folks that always got something negative to say. Huh? When you're around folks, enjoy yourself. And then that whole life force change. And brother, let me just say something to you as I leave. I've been just offered a multi-million dollar contract from a leading university in Germany to come and put a fasting center together. Let me tell you something. I have not discussed this with him. And I saw your man. Let me tell you what we could do. This institution in this town, with what I know, that was a sip of scotch every day, four packs of cigarettes every day, 365 pounds. We could make this institution in this city the weight loss capital of the world. Now hear me, trillions of dollars is spent for people trying to lose weight. Now, I will tell you about my German trip, but here's the deal I make. If you want to sit and talk to this black alumni connected with this institution in this town, we can put this deal together here. Huh? And people will come from all over the world. There are billionaire folks that got children too fat to go to college. They'd love to be able to come to an institution here. And when you help their children, they get bigger. And so I leave you tonight, and I say to you, to the spirit of the brothers and sisters, to the spirit of the decent white folks that's the cause of this institution headed the way it's going, thank you. I love you. God bless you. Peace be with you.